And now, your go-to source for year-round fantasy hockey advice, DFS, and betting coverage. This is NHL Fantasy on Ice, presented by Skip, the official food delivery app of the NHL. The final week of November is already here, brought to you by our good friends over at Skip. It's time for another episode of NHL Fantasy on Ace, Week 8, Waiver Wire Edition, Nick Alberga and Jake Hahn with you. What's going on, Jake? Another week, another coaching change in the National Hockey League. Maybe something we might need to get used to. This coaching change and this podcast brought to you by Skip. Skip to the good part and get groceries, meals, and essentials delivered right to your door on Skip. I like that. We're sponsoring coaching changes now on this podcast. That's great stuff there, Jake. We got Chris Meany coming up in about 10 minutes. We're going to break down this week's waiver wire list. But you're right, Jim Montgomery, the guy was unemployed for like five days, man. Didn't I, and we said it too when uh, when he got hired. I think a lot of people were saying this. Okay, this guy won't last long. But I didn't think it was going to be this quick, Nick. I thought the guy could at least maybe take a vacation somewhere, a couple weeks off, enjoy himself. But I don't even think he had time for that. And clearly St. Louis, and, and they even came out and said this, Doug Armstrong saying, that coaching change basically led to our coaching change. We saw an opportunity, a coach that we really liked, and we thought it's it's an upgrade and we still have a chance to, to salvage our season. Do you feel like St. Louis can actually salvage their season, though? Because this team is, is really, there's not, not much going on there to get excited about. Well, that's the intrigue for me. Like, they needed a boost. They're 9-12-1 as we have this conversation. They're five points out of a playoff spot in the Western Conference. I totally understand why they did it. I think it's a, uh, a stern reminder that it's a business. You sort of have to feel bad for Drew Bannister. Actually lasted 22 full games as a head time coach in this league because he had the interim tag last year. But my major wonder is like goal scoring. You look at the numbers, whether it's, uh, you know, offensively or defensively, they rank like in the bottom seven of the NHL. So I wonder, you know, obviously they were in search of like a boost, what it truly does to bring in one of the best coaches in hockey now because they still have the same players on the ice. It feels like it could be more of a long-term move than a short-term move. I know we always yeah. talk about these as the short-term type moves, right? You want to boost your team. You want to see what you can get out of this season if you have high expectations. This, to me, feels like St. Louis seeing a coach, like you said, one of the top coaches in the game that's proven himself over the last five years or so, locking him down for the next five years and saying, okay, this is our guy. We'll give him the rest of this year to kind of build with this team, right? Expectations will still be low we're probably still going to miss the playoffs but let them get familiar with this group and then next year you know we really try to do something better in St. Louis so I don't know how much of a boost we can expect from this uh, in the short term in, in terms of this year Nick so I, I think when you're talking players specifically uh, Kyrie's already having a great year I'm looking at guys like Buchnevich, Jake Neighbors, Robert Thomas who just came back from injury and obviously the crease we just talked about it the numbers are are pretty scary. Uh, St. Louis 30th in the NHL in goals, 29th in shots on goal, 25th on the power play, 25th in goals allowed, 24th in the PK. I probably prioritize that crease, much similar to the conversation we had about Boston so far so good through two games defensively for that team. That's probably where I would look. But my question is, like, where do we play the initial bounce back? Like, we played, obviously, Boston last week. They win that first game. But this is a tough schedule and maybe this is why they did it. What a timing to make the change to just before Thanksgiving. It is tough, right? If you play that narrative of, okay, first game after the coach coaching change, maybe first couple games after the coaching change, I think if it's something you play consistently, you just, you just blindly play it, right? And you know you're yeah. probably going to take some L's along the way, but with a tough schedule where I mean you should get some pretty big numbers on St. Louis so if it's a narrative that you buy into I think I would still play it and kind of see what happens I like what you said on the goaltending though Nick I think up front not a lot to get excited about with St. Louis fantasy wise I was hoping for better from Jake Neighbors so maybe we can get him going but I think with Montgomery in there maybe a bit more of a commitment to defense and lower scoring games so that could be a good thing if you've got Bennington maybe you want to scoop Joel Hofer up if he can get some starts here I think he's he's very low owned at this point but he had some good starts early in the year. I, I think Hofer would be a guy I would look at. Okay, let's see if we can get him going a little bit and, and lock it down on the back end. At New York Rangers, at New Jersey Devils, home to Philadelphia, the slate this week for the St. Louis Blues. So no doubt they're in tough, but I must say this, if it weren't for uh, Doug Armstrong, this would be a dull league, Jake. The guy just does not care. He really doesn't. <laughs> He doesn't, and I and I I like the honesty too in the comments, yeah. basically saying, okay, this is why we made the coaching change, um, you know, and the the, the Bruins change led us to this, and uh, I appreciate that because uh, you know a lot of the league is is kept under wraps, kind of like the injuries going on around the league right now. Uh, Nick, I I don't know about you, but I'm finding it very difficult to get any sort of injury information on some of these star players, and there's a lot of it going on. 
We'll start with Austin Matthews. Uh, it sounds like there's a potential Jake he could return on Wednesday, but it makes no sense. The Leafs have won seven and eight, uh, seven of eight without him. Well, it's nice because I feel like the last couple times we've talked on the pod, it's been mostly negative with injury news. It's okay. It's Ovechkin. It's Matthews. It's all these big players out. So it's nice to at least get some good news to talk about here. Austin Matthews being one of them sounds like he's close to a return. Even Ovechkin, we're getting some good news on that timeline. And Kirill Kaprizov as well. We can get into that, uh, dodging a major bullet. But I've been impressed by the way the Leafs are, are playing without this guy, man. Like I, you know, obviously it's, it's affording them the chance to make sure he's absolutely 100% percent before he gets back in the lineup you got guys like Mitch Marner William Nylander who would pr- probably be top players best players on any other team in the league they've stepped up in his absence and uh you know given him a chance to to really get healthy before he gets back in here everybody want a free bet when Matthews comes back the Leafs will lose that game guaranteed <laughs> that's guaranteed that's the another narrative kind of like the coaching change narrative right the star player returning to the lineup uh and the team kind of eases up a little bit you know okay everyone goes back to their roles from before so uh I, yeah we don't know exactly what game that's going to be nick but not not a bad play there on Kaprizov, uh, not deemed serious, so great news for the Minnesota Wild who have been banged up themselves throughout this season uh we saw Pyotr Kachekov go down again Looks like an upper body injury, obviously. I wanted to ask you, should the Canes go after a goalie? Uh, There's going to be some names, I think, that filter over the next couple months, namely Gibson in Anaheim. Uh, Mackenzie Blackwood's been out there as well. Simple answer is yes, because they have Frederick Anderson, who we know can't stay healthy. Pyotr Kachekov, who's been relatively good. I know the numbers, uh, at least in terms of of, uh, save percentage, weren't great early in the season, but the record was really good. He's winning games, and I felt like before this most recent injury, he'd actually been playing quite well. So can you trust him for a heavy workload? I don't think so. Okay, you got Spencer Martin there, you know, sort of a a journeyman American Hockey League uh, player that I think could play well behind that team. I mean, I think anyone could play well behind that Canes team. They just do everything uh, excellent and create a good environment for goaltenders. So, yeah, I do think the Canes should be in the market for a goaltender, Nick. I don't know if it's going to be Gibson. I mean, that's a tricky contract uh, to sort of figure out. But there's going to be some names out there. I I think Carolina should be at the top of the market in terms of trying to acquire a goaltender. In short, they had better uh, because that's been their undoing in the playoffs. They can't score. The power play dries up and they can't get a save when it matters most. Uh, I think from a fantasy perspective, Spencer Martin's going to be the guy in the short term, uh, depending on sort of the status here of a Kochekov. But externally, uh, David Riddick's a guy I've really liked uh, as of late here with the LA Kings. Yeah, well, and I I scooped up Spencer Martin last week when sort of this was all going down, but Kochekov's still healthy. And in the back of my mind, I thought, you know what? This is a pretty deep league. There's not a lot on the wire in terms of of goaltending. Yeah, maybe I should just kind of hang on to him and see where this goes. So I'm feeling pretty good about having him right now. I guess he's the starter in Carolina for the time being. I mentioned Joel Hofer uh, earlier uh, in in the podcast, Nick. I I think he's going to get some run. Like Bennington's obviously the guy there in St. Louis, but maybe with the coaching change can turn things around a little bit so I think if you're looking for a goaltending help uh, in a deep league where he might still be available on the waiver wire I'd, I'd give Joel Hofer a shot I like it I like it uh, meantime we reference Alex Ovechkin out four to six weeks with a fractured fibula of note a theme developing really really quickly here they've lost uh, two straight since Ovechkin went down and in a very difficult schedule this week they're at Florida at Tampa home to the Islanders are we seeing some regression finally here for the Capitals Jake I think I think we are. I think with or without Ovechkin, I feel like this was going to happen. You know, I don't, I don't even know if this is Ovechkin related. I think this is just okay. A team that was playing over their head a little bit, not to take anything away from Washington's start, but I don't think any of us expected them to be first in the Metro and keep that up. You know, I think a third spot or a wild card spot would have been a good season for Washington. So I think this is just natural regression. And I mean, when I first saw the timeline on Ovi, it was you know kind of a, a buzzkill, right, to see broken fibula four to six weeks, but. We're already hearing about him, you know, taking twirls on the ice. I mean, this guy's just built different. So uh, I'm going to bet money it's it's closer to the four on that timeline than the the six for Ovi. Very hungry for that record. And again, we reference it a lot uh, on this podcast. This guy never gets hurt. So if he's hurt, he's actually pretty seriously hurt. But we'll see when Ovechkin returns to the lineup for the Washington Capitals. Lastly, uh, Jordan Everly, pelvic surgery out at least three months Um, I got down here, maybe another big chance for Daniel Sprong, who was picked up last week from the Vancouver Canucks. But I'll be honest, Jake, Seattle's a team in general I stay away from in fantasy hockey. 
Well, they're just so tricky because you just don't know who the guy is going to be on a night to night basis. Like you have guys that play 14, 15 minutes and, you know, nobody's really a top guy that's relied upon. I've, I've always liked Bjorkstrand. They're a guy that shoots the puck a lot that can, that can certainly score, but just doesn't get the minutes of the, to be a consistent fantasy player. So there's there's not much in Seattle there outside of the the obvious players that I'd be interested in. All right, Jake, let's look at this week's schedule. we got 11 games on Monday, two Tuesday, 15 on Wednesday. Then we got Thanksgiving on Thursday, so no games. And Black Friday, we come back with 14, 12 on Saturday, 5 on Sunday. A grand slate of 59 games. A very, very busy week in the NHL here. Very busy. A couple slates where you're going to have to make some decisions on that roster, yeah. right? You're going to have to put some players on your bench, and uh, hopefully you don't bench a hat trick or a big game or something like that. I think we've all been there before if you've played fantasy hockey for a while. So I think this week, probably compared to almost any other week of the year, is the schedule is very important. You try to find some players on those off nights so you can at least have something in your lineup. And yeah, it's decision-making time on the on the busy nights. But uh, a good week to be a hockey fan, I would say, Nick, especially if you if you got some time off. And uh, I think a lot of people uh, manipulate the Thanksgiving schedule to get as much time off as possible and, uh, you know, sit on the couch, have a have a couple beers and watch some hockey. That sounds like a great week to me. I love that. And uh, don't forget, people always eager about uh, Thanksgiving and the barometer in terms of teams uh, in or out of the playoff standings. Uh, Just a side note as well, the four game teams, pretty much everyone outside of these teams I'm about to list. So the two game teams you want to stay away from pickup wise, Edmonton and Toronto. The three game teams, you got Buffalo, Chicago, Columbus, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and Utah. So it's one of those weeks where like everybody plays four times, Jake. Well, I, and I heard Buffalo in there as well as a as a busy team. I was looking through it, and I, basically everyone's playing four games, so it's it's tricky to narrow down. Maybe you want to look at some some specific matchups, teams playing on those off nights a little bit as well. Uh, curious if we get to see Tage Thompson here soon in in Buffalo. But hey, they've won three games in a row, and don't look now, Nick. I don't know if you're going to want to hear this. The Buffalo Sabers are in a playoff spot, and we're uh, we're getting pretty close to American Thanksgiving here. Yeah, tell me in a couple of months as we bring in uh, Chris Meany from NHL.com. Means we got to tell you the only person who's allowed to bet on the Buffalo Sabres right now on this podcast is Pete Jensen, who's the biggest fan of all time. Just so you know this, okay? Yeah, I'm aware. Uh, I, I thought that he was uh, a, a little he had a soft spot potentially for the Buffalo Sabres, but getting to know him a little bit more over the past week or so, this guy loves the Buffalo Sabres. Yeah, so he's happy with their hot winning streak, and yeah, right now they're in a playoff spot, playing pretty good hockey without Tage Tom. Means uh, let's look at the waiver wire here. Um, obviously, a busy week, lots of games, but uh, the San Jose Sharks giving us some value right now, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think we brought him up last week, Fabian Zetterlin. I, I think for a point in the betting segment, he's got eight goals and fifteen points. Of course, he's a part of that big trade with Timo Meyer. He's got more goals and points than Timo Meyer at this point of the season as well. He covers a lot of categories. He's got 44 shots. He has 50 hits. If you're playing in a league with hits, he's got 23 blocks, 12 points in his last 15 games up on that top line with Mikhail Granlin and William Eklund, also on that top power play. And Pete will love this as well per NHL edge stats. Zetterlin ranks among the leaders in high danger goals with six in the 95th percentile. So um, a lot of sharks, a lot of value there. You guys were talking about the schedule as well and making tough decisions on those busy slates so Tuesday and Sunday are kind of light nights in the NHL Vancouver Boston and Montreal play on those two a day so I'm taking a look at the Canucks you know we can start here with Kiefer Sherwood uh, I'm not really sure what's going on with him right now but he's touching a lot of categories right he's got points in four straight goals in three straight eight shots on goal in his last two games how about this 10 hits in each of his last two games 38 hits in his last five games he's logging a lot of ice time as well and uh, playing up on that top line with Elias Pettersson and then Jake DeBrusque it wasn't a great start for his you know career in Vancouver I thought he played his best game of the night in the Canucks last game and he had two goals three points five shots and four hits he's got nine points in his last 10 games and five goals over that span so you're looking to get the edge on your opponents you know you will have to make some tough moves like Jake said maybe you you know drop one of those guys that aren't going to touch your lineup on those busy slates and you take a look at some Canucks well I think the Canucks are a good shout obviously short term with the schedule Amini but also long term as well right we don't know how the JT Miller situation is going to play out here moving forward obviously we're wishing the best for him but some opportunity in that lineup you mentioned a couple guys that are taking that 
that opportunity and kind of running with it so far. Uh, a team that uh, seems to interest you a lot and has interested me actually quite a bit this year, um, obviously not winning a ton of games, but fantasy-wise, there's some value in Columbus right now, is there not? Oh, there really is. Yeah, you look at some of their numbers, it kind of surprises you. They're eighth in goals per game, 3.45. They're fourth in shots per game. You look at their five and five numbers, they're fifth in shot attempts and expected goals. They're inside the top 10 in scoring chances and high danger chances. A 5-4 win against Carolina over the weekend, a 7-6 win before that against Tampa. They blew out the Bruins, got Montgomery fired after a 5-1 win in Boston. And look up and down their lineup. Sean Monahan has got seven goals and 20 points in 20 games. He has nine points over his last five. He's a beast in the face-off circle if you're playing with face-off wins. Kirill Marchenko, excuse me, he's got eight goals and 20 points in 20 games as well. Loves to shoot the puck. Three-plus shots and six of seven, four points over his last two games. he got Veronikov on that top line as well. Goals in three straight, five of eight. Ken Johnson returned to the lineup over the past week. And, you know, this is clearly unsustainable. But he's played six games. He has nine points. He's got four goals. He's got a point in every game. He has four on the power play. So he's just getting an opportunity, right? The Columbus Blue Jackets are very thin, you know, in their top six, 18 plus minutes and four of six. So, you know, really rocky start to his career, Nick. But this is a former fifth overall pick. He's got a lot of skill, a lot of upside. He's on that second line in the first power play. So yeah, don't look now with the Blue Jackets. They're fine. At least, you know, from a fantasy perspective, there's a lot of goals in their games. The big word there is uh, opportunity, obviously, up the middle, Boone Jenner, the captain out of the lineup, and uh, whether you know Johnson plays uh, up the middle or on the wing, I think there's going to be opportunity to grow with that team, and they're they're a team that just continues to be slept upon throughout this season, and uh, I found them in very favorable spots from a betting lens as well. So definitely have my eyes on the uh, Columbus Blue Jackets. It means I wanted to ask you, and this pertaining to the list as well, how you have traditionally attacked teams that make coaching changes. We talked about Boston. We still wonder if that team can score goals and. Now the St. Louis Blues get Jim Montgomery. Yeah, I, I heard you guys earlier, and I agree with you know both of your takes. It's just the personnel, right? It's like when we talked about the Boston Bruins. You expect their top guys to turn things around. They rattled off a couple wins, and you know we talked about Marshan and David Pasternak, and those guys showed up. Elias Lindholm showed up as well, but you know outside of Robert Thomas, Pavel Buchnevich, Jordan Cairo, you know we're not going to pick up Brandon Saad. And, you know he's a great five and five player, but he's not going to do a whole lot for your fantasy hockey squad. So I'm looking at those top guys to be looking to see you know if there's any movement with some of their lines the power play usage and, and whatnot but they're the second fewest in expected goals at five and five they don't have a lot of offense they're in the bottom 10 of a lot of categories including high danger chances and scoring chances so Buchnevich a little fun revenge game against the Rangers uh in his next matchup but other than those couple of guys I mean, there's really not a lot that the Blues have to offer at the moment. Speaking of the Rangers, there was an interesting Rangers name on the waiver wire list, meaning Will Cooley. Are, are we legitimately buying into this file? I, at one point, I thought, okay, this is just a little bit of a hot run. It's, it's tough to buy into the depth guys in New York because there's so many big boys there. But, I mean, he's making the most of his minutes right now. It's impressive. Yeah, it really is. 17-28 in his last game against the Oilers. This is a guy that kind of lives in the 11-12 minute range. I think if you're playing in a deeper format with hits, I mean, that's the biggest thing. I know a lot of people don't play with hits. I mean, the scoring, I don't think is going to continue. It's nice that he's got seven goals here and 15 points through 19 games. But you look at the hits, 4-3, 3-10 three, three, over his last four games. I would consider selling high on him, but what could you get, right? You ride this out. You know, he's a streamer, especially in those leagues with hits. But yeah, offensively, I don't think that this is going to continue for him means what about the crease if you're trying to stream a guy or employ a guy in dfs uh kirill vimelka is on this week's list i mentioned uh, david riddick earlier on where are you looking right now yeah i think vimelka is the the one to consider at the moment i mean he could take this net to whenever connor ingram is ready to return three straight starts seeing the back-to-back -back, right he played last night against the leafs turned aside 32 of 35 shots he faced against pittsburgh 27 of 28 by the way the pens are absolutely hurting <laughs> um but yeah six straight appearances for him as well so so, you know, he is a guy to consider. You guys mentioned Martin as well. Um, I think we will see the Carolina Hurricanes make a move in net. I agree with you guys. Like, this is a team that has to kind of go all in. Their window is right now. Uh, but Dave Riddick is still out there. Uh, potentially, you can pick him up. Um, other than that, you're really just streaming the position. You know, Jake Allen had a start over the weekend. Um, you know, I, I would say Gibson, you know, especially if you're in a league with saves. You know, you can maybe weather the storm on some of those games. You're going to have a high goals against average, but the save percentage and the saves, they should be there playing with the Ducks. 
Are you buying Buffalo at all a little bit here? Is this just a three-game win streak against kind of bad teams, or at least a couple that were bad teams? I, I guess the LA win was a, a nice win, but it didn't seem like LA really showed up for that game. Or are you buying, or is this just, okay, classic Sabres, show me, uh, like Nick said, show me in a couple months? Yeah, I'm kind of with Nick, show me in a couple months. This team has, has shown us things over the past couple of years where it's like, okay, they're knocking on the door, the young kids are starting to hit their stride. Uh, but I, I'm... I'm buying in more so this year than in the past. All right, JJ Paterka is 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 for real. He's you know he's breaking out. You got Owen Power and Bowen Byram on the blue line. Rasmus Dahlin's a top five defenseman. You can make a case he's a top three. He's a horse on the blue line. It was really fun to watch them in overtime the other night. Him take over. But Owen Power ranks second in the NHL with 15 even strength points, just behind Kill McCarr, which is pretty impressive on the blue line. So yeah, they've won four four or five. You get Tage Thompson back. He's a I'm a big believer in Tage Thompson and and Alex Tuck. And um, yeah, I mean with with Boston, Detroit, Ottawa you know, struggling in the Atlantic. Buffalo is is right there in this thing. NHL.com slash fantasy, where you can check out this entire uh, week and the list. Um, let's get to the betting segment here, guys. Lots going on. A 59-game slate, 11 games on Monday. Two games I like specifically. Uh, Washington at Florida. I like Panthers in regulation in that game. And uh, can't believe I'm doing this again. Calgary at Ottawa. I call it a must win for the Ottawa Senators. You guys riding with me or just fading me at this point? I got to ride with you, Nick. You've been pretty good this year. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not going to fade you. You've been. You've been pretty solid with the picks. So I'll. I'll ride with you on that one. I'm looking to Vegas and and Philly guys. Uh, Vegas, a pretty small favorite in this game on the road. I'll. I'll dare the Flyers to to beat me on this one. I think to get a better price, maybe play the puck line or Vegas in regulation. I, I just think they're the much better team right now. Maybe we look to the the point prop market. I've been really loving uh, the lines they've been setting on Ivan Barbashev. Get plus money for a point there. Uh, maybe you want to play Eichel for a couple of points. I I think this Vegas team should be able to score on Philly. I just don't trust their goaltending situation right now. Yeah, I'm with you on that as well. I like Vegas tonight and maybe take a look at Thomas Hurdles, another guy, right? Five points in his last six games, nearly even money for a point. He's got 17 points in 21 games. I like Dallas on the money line. They're slight dogs against Carolina. We've been talking about their goaltending issues. I just think the Stars against anybody on any given night, especially when you can get good odds for them on the road. And we mentioned Wyatt Johnson last week as well. He's got points in back-to-back games. Pete DeBoer's got him up on that top line. So look for Wyatt Johnson to continue his, uh, you know, find the back of the net and picking up some points. Points. Means I know you're a big uh, props guy. I know you're going to be watching some tissues, watching D- Jake DeBrusque's return to uh, Boston coming up on Tuesday night. But I'm going to play the anytime goal, Vancouver at Boston, and the shot prop there. Do you like those two plays? <laughs> Yeah, I do. Um, absolutely, right? The the boost in ice time, we talked earlier about the Canucks, so uh, I like that call. And, you know, Jonathan Jordan's another guy, you know, to, you know, from a fantasy hockey standpoint, picking him up. The Avs are cooking right now, guys. They're back. They're healthy. They've won three straight, six of seven, and Jordan's got three points in his last four games since returning to the lineup, too. So books are kind of a little slow to adjust on on his point value. Well, two teams in that central division that have also been cooking have been Winnipeg and Minnesota all season, and those two teams go head to head on Monday night. I don't know if Nick, do you, do you have a play here in in this one? It's tricky without f- known status on Kirill Kaprizov, but Minnesota as a home dog, I think with or without him, uh, obviously the price will change when when we when we get the legitimate status on him. But I don't mind Minnesota as a home dog here. Yeah, I mean either. Um, I and it's my gut, and this is just my gut that Kaprizov plays in that game, but. What's been our, our historical move with Minnesota on home ice? Play the over, right? I don't know how strongly I feel about that just because of how banged up Minnesota is and how locked in Winnipeg is defensively. So maybe you look at the the under in that game. Do you guys support that or not really? I think it's true. Well, I mean, any under yeah. that involves Connor Hellebuck, uh, I'm yeah. kind of interested in because of the way that he could play. Uh, but I do think more of a commitment to defense, especially if Kirill Kaprizov is actually out. Okay, yeah. try to lock it down, try to win a lower scoring game. And I, I think sometimes when you get a couple rival teams like this that, you know, both are legitimate playoff teams, you kind of get that playoff style uh, of hockey game, which uh, could tend to be a little bit lower scoring as well. There's one more player and team I wanted to bring up with you guys and get your thoughts. And, you know, speaking of the Jets, they lost to Nashville over the weekend. This Predators team, right? I mean, they're dead last in shooting percentage at 5-5, five and 5%. Five, 5 They're dead last in goals at 5-5 five and five with 23. If you can believe it, Jonathan Marcheseau just picked up his first 
five and five goal and five and five assist over the weekend of the season. I do think kind of the opposite of what we talked about, what's going on in Washington right now, where there was bound to be a little negative regression for Washington. I think there's bound to be some positive regression for Nashville, even if you don't fully buy into the team. And and like you said, Nick, there are legitimate concerns down the middle of the ice. They never address those issues. They went out and got two, they, they got two wingers over the age of 30. So I think they're, they're kind of showing, okay, maybe, maybe that wasn't the right move. Maybe we should have addressed other areas. So I do, I do have concerns for them long term, but uh, like Meany mentioned, short term, I, I do think we're seeing a little bit of positive regression for this team. So it might be backable, might be some fantasy players that, that we can uh, we can look at. But that's that's really where it ends for Nashville for me. Yeah, I think it's the offense is what we're looking at specifically. You know what you're going to get from UC Saros, but I still I still think it's going to be uphill sledding to make the the Stanley Cup playoffs for this team. I just, I don't see it in the cards. I, I think if they were in a different division, maybe you could sell me on it, but that central division didn't wait for them, right? Like Colorado's no. made their move now. Minnesota and Winnipeg have obviously been excellent all season long. I just don't know where the spot is. Unless one of those teams goes full flaps, which I, I don't think either of us see unless, unless uh, you know, a lot of injuries come into play here. I just, I, I don't see it for the for the Predators. I think they dug themselves way too deep of a hole and play in a, a division with some some absolute horses at the top. One more bet I like just to wrap here. A Wednesday slate, man. This is going to be mayhem. I don't know how you particularly play uh, the night or the day before Thanksgiving, but we sit, we tend to see a lot of overs. One over I do like, Jake. Vancouver on uh, against Pittsburgh on the road in Pitt. Over six and a half, four straight caches between these two sides. Oh, man, I don't even know what to do with Pittsburgh at this point. I, I think in the prop market, we could still play some pens. Like, you want to play the Crosby shot prop? I mean, he was firing over the weekend to get that 600th goal. It was nice to see him get that, but that was the only bright spot for Pittsburgh. I, don't, I actually don't mind his assist prop that usually hangs around even money, something in, in that range. So uh, there is still some props in, in Pittsburgh to back. I'm looking at Black Friday, uh, Nick. No games okay. specifically. You mentioned you know how Thanksgiving could affect these players. That's the post-Turkey day, right? Like, do we get some sleepy home teams? teams I'd I don't know is that an angle that, that we can play where okay you're at home you're comfortable you're with the family you had some yeah you maybe had a couple beers you watch the football game uh, and then you're feeling a little lazy the next day maybe road teams on Black Friday uh, could be a, a strategy we'll see okay I like that angle if I do recall last year I tried to hit a lot of overs on Black Friday and it just didn't work to my advantage every year is different but I, I think it's a strong angle to play when you're looking for a bit of an edge here right I think so as well. And I'm, I'm looking forward to this week. I, I really am. I know uh, everybody's south of the border in the U.S. I hope everyone has a, an excellent Thanksgiving. And like I said earlier, Americans know how to manipulate the Thanksgiving. It's, they do it so much better than we do in Canada, uh, Nick, in terms of time off. We, we get like one day off. They get like 17 days off. People are probably, they've already probably already been off for like four days. Right, Bob? You talk about manipulating the schedule. Nobody does it better than old Bob Bender during a <laughs> feast week with the hoops. I got a hoops oh, game hoops. starting in like 10 minutes. Chicago State, take the points. Yeah, you won't see me back in the office for another week. But yes, it's very important that you manipulate and massage that schedule. Look at Pete Jensen. He's already manipulating and massaging. True. He wasn't here today. Chris Meany had to fill in. And now it's time for you, Nick, to put a bow on it. Mail it in Monday, as we call it here on uh, NHL Fantasy on Ice. So uh, we won't be with you, obviously, later on this week. We'll be back on Monday for the Week 9 Mailbag edition of this show. Once again, happy Thanksgiving to everybody celebrating. Thank you to producer Bob Bender for Jay Con and Chris Meany. I'm Nick Alberga. You've been listening to NHL Fantasy on Ice, delivered by Skip. Skip to the good part and get groceries, meals, and essentials delivered right to your door on Skip. Skip.